This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. And this week, a bunch of us hosts and co-hosts are getting together to talk about Web 3.0, what that means. We go back into deep history. We look at what happened with the SCO versus IBM and lots of other companies' lawsuit that we thought would never end, but reportedly got settled. Um, what's, you know, what's going on with privacy and whether or not people care about it, like they care about being stalked, but they don't necessarily care about privacy. So all of those topics are up and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 657, recorded Wednesday, November 24th, 2021. Web 3.0 and beyond. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Good whatever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. This week, our guests are each other. There is a whole past love us here. Uh, in fact, a whole four. There we are. For those of you who can watch your radios, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's me, there's Aaron Newcomb, Simon Phipps, and Catherine Druckmann going left to right, <laughs> which is the way we read in this language that, that we're using in this thing. And we're just, we're going to go over some of the things that are happening right now. And, um, and I, I might as well just get started by, you know, we've, we've all shared with each other uh, some links and things. Um, and I actually like to start with, with Aaron, who put an oldie, but a goodie here, which is the, the lawsuit that will never end the original SCO versus IBM lawsuit. Uh, was settled, which is um, most of us who cared about this a long time ago, A, forgot that it actually was ha still happening and B, assumed it would never end. So what do you have on that? There it is. Yeah, yeah. So I'll kick this off, but I think that others on the on the call were closer to this than I was. But this was a big deal, uh, you know, 20 years ago when, you know, uh, Unix was uh, going back and forth between uh, who owns it, who created it, uh, you know, who bought what, and all of this stuff. And so lawsuits were filed. It was a really big deal. And apparently, according to this article anyway, by the lovely Stephen J. Von Nichols, uh, who we know and love, um, this has been settled. At least the, the lawsuit uh, between SCO and IBM has been settled. Um, I think there were multiples. Uh, but this has been settled for, uh, I saw the number here, uh, $14,250,000, uh, which was paid to a holding group called TSG Group, which is probably one of these groups that bought up whatever you know IP was left over to try to continue to litigate this case to death. Uh, but this has been uh, apparently resolved. And I didn't even know, to be honest, I thought this was resolved a long time ago. I didn't even know this was an open issue. So, uh, yeah, brings back uh, some some old memories probably for a lot of people, some of them not so nice. What do you guys think? Absolutely. Well, you know, it's a fascinating old story. It's worth digging into why the story was happening in the first place. Um, the, 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 the story was happening because SCO bought the rights to Unix. And uh, as it gradually became apparent that Linux was going to whip Unix's ass, uh, the, they began to question whether they had invested their money well. And I, I, we used to see SCO coming around at Sun fairly often uh, because yep. Sun yep. was a, a licensee of Unix. And um, in actual fact, Sun, uniquely amongst the Unix licensees, had bought an outright perpetual license to Unix. So we didn't have to keep on re-upping and we could actually open source the code, which we eventually did uh, in, in the form of Solaris. And we used to have uh, the holder of the copyrights for Unix come around every year and try to sell us all the changes that the other licensees had made and then buy back from us all the changes we had made. And so SCO, SCO became this kind of clearinghouse between all of the Unix licensees and consequently was able to uh, harvest money by uh, buying and then multiply reselling uh, changes that have been made to the software. And the open source model was absolute death to that business model that they had there, which is why they were so vigorously trying to uh, fend off the the attack. And, and they went on the attack on multiple fronts. So they, they went after IBM because IBM famously promoted Linux uh, as a uh, an operating system, said it was going to invest a million dollars in it. 
um, promoted it in its products. But they SCO also went after a whole load of other people as well. They went after Red Hat. Uh, they went after AutoZone. They went after Daimler Chrysler. And um, all of the attacks that they were making were based on a raft of patents that they owned, as well as the Unix copyrights. And those patents had a life beyond SCO. So those patents got sold a few years back, and there is some company that now owns them. And I'm fully expecting, um, like uh, the uh, the regular return of a comet, to have a return of this lawsuit as that new owner of the patents gets to grips with them and finds new people to attack. So, Aaron, I, you know, I admire your optimism, but this uh, 20-year-long <laughs> saga may not necessarily be over yet. You know, I'm, uh, of course, I wrote about this, and we paid a lot of attention to it, at Linux Journal back in the decades. Yeah. Um, and I'd forgotten, I'm, I'm following some links here, that Novell was involved for a while when Novell was real. Um, I mean, so, so much of the ownership of companies and the ownership of whatever IP came along with companies has changed over time. I remember well, I may have even met you at one of those meetings at, at Sun, Simon, when, uh, when Sun was trying to mush together what everybody just called SVR four at the time, which is system five release mm -hmm. four of, of, of AT and T Unix, whatever AT and T was back then, which it isn't anymore. It's what we call AT and T now is something else as well. It's one of its one of its children is, that now has the logo and the name. Um, it's it's all it's all terribly complicated, and it is keeping lawyers going. Uh, you know, I remember going to back before SCO turned evil. You know, and and these guys with the last name Michaels, it's in in, in uh, Santa Cruz, because it stood for Santa Cruz operation, and they actually were in Santa Cruz. And you could go down; they had nice food and you know nice meetings and things like that, which is about all I remember was going to Santa Cruz and talking. No, it was, to a, these it was guys. a good place for a meeting. It was a you know great place, and I uh, <laughs> and and also the the thing you got to recall is that when this all started out, it it didn't look quite as sick and evil as it gradually became evident that it mm -hmm. was. You know, it looked like a commercial yeah. dispute. It looked like a contractual dispute. It looked like a defensive business dispute. And uh, what made it unique was the way that it gradually got taken over by its lawyers and what yeah. whereas it had started out being a company uh, uh defending itself against the business model of another company it gradually became the lawyers for that company monetizing their client and monetizing the lawsuit in perpetuum and you know gradually sucking all the life out of the client and all the money out <laughs> of them and and then starting up other lawsuits that they could win to bring more money in to continue funding things. And the people who did really well out of this were SCO's lawyers, who were the ones who wanted the case to carry on for so long. Um, yeah, so that, I think you've got, you've got to have a bit of perspective about that. And that still happens. I think that's the, the big lesson to draw from this is that um, – uh, it is not uncommon to discover that lawyers would really like a lawsuit to carry on a little bit longer, please, because it's really very profitable uh, having clients who have a uh, an unmitigated and unreasonable hatred of each other. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't well, it, say... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, it doesn't say in the article, you know, how much the lawyers got, right, out of all the money from this thing, but I assume most of it went to all them. All of it. <laughs> <clears throat> if not all of it, yeah. Yeah, so, and they probably didn't have to do much. I mean, the article says this has been sitting basically uh, on the side in bankruptcy court um, for for years and years. And so all they had to do was kind of keep the keep it keep it alive, you know, feed it a few papers here and there every now and then, right? And they got their uh, they got yeah. their monthly fee probably. Lawyers, you know, for, lawyers. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> I, an interesting thing. I mean, historically, is that it's. It's easy to forget, especially if you weren't born back then and you didn't live way back then, that um, before there was Linux and before there was op even the term open source didn't come into popular use until 1998. Uh, free software started in 1984, but Unix started before all of that. And mm -hmm. there were multiple Unix companies. They were all proprietary. They all sold a kind of Unix. And the, the alpha there was... Um, was uh was at t but Sco was one of those they were just one of a you know one in a pack and sun was a bigger one in those days but um but linux changed the whole show <laughs> it just changed it completely in the in the 90s but this all began way way back in that kind of prehistory does anybody know what Sco's original name was oh sorry santa Kathy. cruz operation 
Santa what was their Cruz original name Santa before that? <laughs> before oh, that? No. Oh, boy. Oh, trick question. Wow. Caldera International. I thought Caldera, Caldera really? International. I, didn't yeah. Caldera buy them? Really? Mm -hmm. I thought Caldera, I have to, I, I want to yep. see it for source. Because Caldera was one of the many Linux companies in the late 80s, late 90s, early aughts. And I think they're the one that kind of went evil when they bought Sco. That's my uh, half a memory. Do you remember uh, Catherine? Were you back uh, Linux Journal back then? Oh God, yeah, I, I was. Yes, probably. But I, I you know, I, I am uh, with Aaron that I didn't remember that this was still going on. <laughs> but I do think yeah. it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting reminder, especially to people who are sort of newer, newer to open source about the, the things that can go wrong. <laughs> a reminder to us all, right? Yeah, there's That's a right. there's a Wikipedia entry called Sco yeah. Linux Disputes that may it was answer the other way some around. of this. Yeah, it was the yeah. other way around. I think you're right there, Doc. Uh, I've just I'm, I'm pasting in a Wikipedia page into our shared chat here so you can see it. So what happened was Caldera was a, a company that was making a, a, a Linux and a Unix operating system, and they bought Sco in uh, yeah. 2003. Uh, oh, yeah. I see. It was through acquisition. Yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they renamed themselves because Sco was a known name and Caldera wasn't. And yeah. Sco had a had a prior product called Unixware, that was one of the right. um, one of the big um, uh, civil sector uh, products, and um, that was the product that was being about to be severely impacted by IBM's Linux-based strategy, and also by Red Hat. And they they saw Red Hat as being a, a, a boosted by IBM, which is why they also went after Red Hat with the lawsuit. Uh, but yeah, uh, they they've been around for a long time before that. They they've been around as a private company for for a couple of decades before uh, they were acquired yeah. by Caldera. And then yeah. they uh, they bought the uh, Unix copyrights from AT and T, and then they sold them on to Novell, and then Novell sold them after that. I forget who owns them now. Um, Novell. That's a yeah, question. yeah. Novell. Uh, Novell did. You know the, the the husk that was left of Novell got acquired by somebody. <laughs> I don't know. It's sort well, they, of like they got they got bought by um, that um, a British software company along with HP's assets. Well, they got bought by HP, and then they got then those right. assets got bought by a UK company. Uh, yeah, I've checked. did they get the snake or the shed skin? <laughs> it's like it's hard to uh, know. Yeah, it's. It's fascinating. So, so now, now you've got look, look what you've done. You've got me diving into Wikipedia pretty soon. <laughs> well, we, pretty soon we I'm going to be researching armadillo we recipes. Have a, or something. There's a bingo here. We could check that one off. <laughs> Made Simon look at Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, he didn't remember everything. Oh well. So, so um, let's go from the old to the new. Uh, so, Catherine, you're. You have a story on the new life of PHP. Oh, I do. What's going on there? Yeah. What's so there? a bunch of a bunch of companies got together. So PHP is very important to the internet and, and a lot of people, and um, so is financial support. So a bunch of companies, the one I work for included, in full disclosure, got together and are funding a new PHP foundation. So you ah. know to pay contributors to the PHP which is so important. I mean, it, it's, it reminded me, you know, I saw this come across the, the Twitter yesterday, probably. And, you know, it reminded me of that. I think it's an XKCD cartoon where, it, you know, it shows like the entire internet is supported by this, you know, obscure library somewhere with this guy propping it up. And, and that's certainly not something we want to happen to PHP. It's pretty important. So uh, I thought that was newsworthy. I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a fan of um, you know, sponsored open source contribution I mean, I think, I think it's necessary uh, to to support projects like this. So, so yeah, I don't know if y'all have any thoughts about about maybe who's behind it or or uh, sustainability issues, but it seems like yeah, I was just reading. I was just right reading that. Right uh, I, I hadn't read the article um, because I like I like to stay fresh, um, <laughs> but I was just reading here that uh, Nikita Popoff is leaving as part of this as well. Yes. 
So where does that, where does that leave things? Um, I mean, it's always when, cause I think uh, Nikita was one of the founding or the founder of PHP, right? Or starting the program up and everything. So that, I mean, is that, uh, is that a concern or is that uh, it's time? One of those things where it's time to leave. <laughs> time um, to go do something you know, else. You know, I, I think that I, I can only assume because I'm not, Include in uh, you know with those conversations, but I could I could assume that 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 may be a big motivator here. You know, if you lose a you know a significant contributor, you you know it's probably time to start making sure the others are supported. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean I I don't I don't know that for a fact, obviously, but but um, well, actually, no, it mentions this in the JetBrains post that that his <laughs> his decision forced them to uh, intensify their work on the foundation. So. So yeah, uh, yeah th those of us who benefit from from PHP and that number is very large uh, need people like this to be supported by significant funding. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's and it's not the same. I would say in the open source world as it is a big commercial company. You know, when a founder leaves, right? I mean, when Steve Jobs leaves mm -hmm. or or gets kicked out, depending on how you interpret that story, uh, from Apple, you know, everything goes you know, downhill because they were the driving force behind this thing. And I guess it can be true for an open source project if you really have an enig enigmatic, uh, outspoken person in the project. But I think by and large that that impact is reduced when someone leaves because you hopefully have a whole community behind you. And, uh, you, you know, everyone's just going to chip in and keep it going and start foundations like the PHP Foundation, apparently, to keep things uh, uh, you know, keep developers hopefully pay them and for their work and everything. So, I think that I think that is minimized as a general rule with with open source projects. You know, it, um, I remember when I started at Linux Journal, which depending on when you date it is either ninety four or ninety six, but it was back in that time. I remember somebody at a party saying to me, uh, "This is Guy Rasmus, and he has this thing called PHP, and you need to look into it because it's cool." And there were so many of those in, the, in those days that were early, you know, um, I don't remember much more about that. Um, but I see he's still a contributor. Um, he's employed mm -hmm. as a distinguished engineer at Etsy. Um, so I'm not sure I've ever met him, but. Uh, but uh, I think he was on one of the covers. I feel like I have a souvenir. I think he was on one of the Linux Journal, Journal covers. Cover. Yeah. We I published it long time, enough though. that pretty much everybody was on the cover at some point. That's true. Uh, That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you make something useful and stuff happens, you know. Um, it's true. And, uh, you know, he he certainly did with PHP. Um, so, um, so, Simon, do you have something there? Uh, well, uh, you know, I can carry, I can segue on from there for you because uh, one of the stories that I've been looking at this week is about how uh, the domain host GoDaddy, who I sincerely hope isn't a sponsor, uh, is um, has allowed their identity management system to be hacked. And the result has been literally millions of installs of WordPress have been potentially compromised. And, um, you know, th th that can happen to anybody. Uh, can happen to the best of us. What really struck me about it was two things. First of all, um, GoDaddy, as far as I know, um, are strip miners of WordPress. They contribute nothing to it. Uh, and secondly was the story that was in um, uh, ZDNet that led by saying over a million WordPress sites compromised, didn't even mention GoDaddy in the headline. And uh, somehow um, GoDaddy allowed everyone to get hacked and open source has taken the blame and um i i've kept on seeing this over the last few years i've i've it was like with the the heartbeat heartbleed bug something about being public and being reusable by anybody it makes open source sharp everywhere and when it gets compromised, it's typically not the open source's fault that that happened. It's typically because somebody who's using it did something wrong. And yet it's the open source that carries the blame. Uh, and I don't know what we do about this uh, to, to help people understand that what happened here was GoDaddy screwed up and 
their customers have had compromised websites, not that WordPress sites have been breached or WordPress has been compromised. And I did actually see uh, Matt Mullenweg uh, coming back at um, at oh, uh, uh, the article today and saying, "Hey, just just let me just point out to you that your story is framed completely wrong, even if the data points in it are defensible." Uh, so, as a as a, a writer, you know, but both Doc and Catherine, how do you feel about the fact that? ZDNet led by saying a million WordPress sites breached rather than saying GoDaddy uh, has allowed itself to be hacked. Oh, you boy. You, I, okay. you know, I, I, I'm so sort of steeped in open source that I just sort of discount when I hear something like that. I just assume that it, you know, it's not an, it's not the fault of open source. It's like saying, yeah. you know, it, the fault is wood, not particle board. You really need to use particle board instead of wood. You know, well, it, <laughs> it's wood and particle board and and the design of wood is free um uh but i'm i'm not surprised if when when i mean especially if when there's money involved if a big company is not mentioned in something like that um i don't think they are a sponsor by the way i know hover is and i use them <laughs> so yeah I've, i'm glad i've moved all my GoDaddy domains to hover so uh, I've pretty much finished moving all of my GoDaddy domains to Hover now. I've only got three left on GoDaddy and uh, all the rest are on Hover. So I, I like Hover and I'm very yeah, happy when well, there's <laughs> with personal friends there as well. And it's not just that they're a sponsor. Absolutely. Um, well, it's, it's the fact that it's still two cows. You know, I remember downloading stuff from exactly. two cows bulletin boards in the eighties and it's still the same company going strong. It, it, and two cows still exists for those listening is T U C O W S. Not the number two, but T U cows, and um, it's the parent company of of Hover and and Ting Fiber, which is quietly fibering up small towns and cities all over the U.S. Uh, mm. They're based in Canada. Um, so I, I'm Could, not, you know, I, I, it's I don't I, I just sort of discount all those stories, uh, you know, because it's usually I mean, look where the big targets are. You know, if somebody if somebody bad wants to get at something, where's the big target? You know, it's going to be it's going to be a GoDaddy. It's going to be some some large repository of of namespaces or whatever that they can get into. Could this be, Doc? I mean, uh, a, a case of an editor? Because I'm curious now. I'm looking at this after Simon asked the question so provocatively. Uh, I'm looking at the title of the ZDNet uh, uh, story, which is over a million WordPress sites breached. And then, but the actual URL is over a million GoDaddy managed WordPress sites cracked. And I'm wondering if this is oh. the case of, you know, you, usually what happens is you take the title and it becomes the URL, right? At least in WordPress, the title becomes right. the URL. And I'm wondering if somebody went in and said, oh, this title's too long. We have to shorten it. Or uh, it's not provocative enough, you know, to say it that way. So we need to shorten it to say, to be more general. Um, um, well, I mean, I guess we could, ask, fashion, we could ask Stephen. Yeah. He would know. <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, in in old fashioned well, guess, uh, print places, you you had to, you had, the headline writer was not the article writer, and you know, in, in larger in larger operations, that's almost always the case, and it's likely. I'm that, sure in, that's that, the case here. Yeah, yeah. You know, given it's you know. Stephen as the author, I would I would kind of expect that 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 you know, Aaron, you oh for you've, sure. You've, you've, You've sniffed it out there. I think that the title that was originally in the CMS <laughs> yeah. was over a million GoDaddy managed sites cracked. And then right. uh, WordPress was inserted into that. And then the editor, whoever that is, looked at that and said, hey, that's not going to get any clicks. Yeah, you know, think of yeah the it's too long. Yeah. It, 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 it's too wide for mobile. I mean, that's another thing because they, they're going to look at it in three widths, you know, and say, no, look, that takes up takes up the whole above the fold if you got that whole headline. Yeah. You got to shorten that down. They, they all already hate GoDaddy, but they love WordPress. Blame WordPress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's for yeah. a story. Yeah, and, and the number you got to get the million in there, right? You got to get that. In. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I know I when I saw it, I thought because of. You know, I've got a whole bunch of WordPress sites. None of them are with GoDaddy, though. They're all, you know, at universities or some other place. So I was yeah. less worried about that. But um, personally, but it's still I'm, I'm I'm looking, you know, hurriedly here for where um, Matt Mullenweg said something. Um, but I don't I, see it. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, that was on Twitter. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, so I, I, I can segue on from from this way as well, uh, if if you'd like, Doc, because I think that Go your story that you've put up there. Uh, so, Doc put a story up on Twitter uh, today about how um, the 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 Earth was originally created by the collision between two planets. So, how do you pronounce <laughs> that? Is that Sire? Yeah. Is that? No, it's, so I, I, it's it's pronounced Thea, I believe. Thea, okay. I, I wasn't there to hear her. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I wasn't saying you were old enough to have heard it pronounced. I'm so, I, you know, um, <laughs> Just 4.5 billion years ago. It, but it, Doc was noting how how it took a collision between two planets to, to get the world working right and wondering whether the solution to the problem that, uh, you know, the, that story I just highlighted up there probably the headline was set the way that it was to drive advertising clicks and driving advertising Ooh. clicks is 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 what's yeah, breaking no, society that, i i read and, that headline and, 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 <laughs> yes <laughs> and there's so no it, advertising it, on that site so <laughs> so, so the, you know, just, the question and, the question here is 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 this what we need to 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 fix well, the I, I, he, uh, the, the, the advertising you, powered internet yeah. Well, first, I, it depends on the things. audience first, you're trying to the, attract. The, first, the internet is not powered by anything. You know, it's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of nodes, uh, you know, cooperating and connected to each other over many different paths and by agreement about a protocol. And and that's been the same for thirty plus years, and it's not going to change. I mean, the internet's fine. It's you know, saying that something that the internet is funded by advertising is ludicrous. It's like saying gravity is funded by a traffic mall or, you know, by, you know, by roads or traffic or something else like that. It doesn't make any sense. But, um, but the, the business mo- the business called surveillance capitalism, which Shoshana Zuboff named surveillance capitalism, um, which is basically entirely funded by tracking based advertising. And, the, the we have the we've had the policy solutions to it which have failed um the gdpr and the ccpa in california we have a bureaucracy uh, the ccpa now spells the name of the agency and not just the law um but what we have it is a, is a horrible experience in every new website we go to because we're obliged to to or not necessarily obliged sometimes you can click past it but it wants you to assent to having tracking and exactly what you know, there's a massive business in 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 getting in, in GDPR compliance and CCPA compliance and all that entire business. You know, hundreds or thousands of companies are in the business of helping helping website owners um, obey the letter of the GDPR and the CCPA while totally screwing its spirit. So, a friend of mine in the UK actually suggested something called Adverside, which is just kill it all. Let's just do something. We need a new browser. He was suggesting a new browser. That did nothing but kill all advertising, not just the kind based on tracking, but all of it. And I actually started writing a piece about that. But then I found this other one that I'd written a year ago on another site. <laughs> this one's in Medium um, uh, called We Need a Thea because I, I felt we needed something really big to um, not, not hit the web so much at all. I mean, but just to basically blow up to blow up that business model, you know, to give to give us the power to say what we what we want when we go from site to site or service to service or you know operate our own um servers on the web or anywhere you know where we're in charge this basically we just need to be in charge and the web is not built that way for us right now you know it has been built that way since we started on client server a long time ago and that's kind of rigged against us but i sort of feel like we need something big to happen and mm-hmm. the context what, what, there, that, what just, would that look like I don't what, know. What would that look I like, mean, Doctor? Because I mean, GDPR I, I, and 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 the California law are both both look like a, an asteroid coming to hit Facebook and Google, and they they yeah. turned out actually to be a business booster for both of them that killed off the small guys. Yeah, and and it also a business booster for an entire gigantic cottage industry of, of for GDPR and CCPA compliance. A zillion lawyers, with, you know you know, went into business, you know, coming up, well, we're going to one trust and a bunch of other companies, you know, when you go to a website and you, and you, if you bother to not accept, you go to like my preferences, you know, my cookie preferences and you click there and there's this secondary, it's not even a page, it's like a part of a page, it's like a popover. And you go down that and, you know, the sliders, you kind of hard to tell what's on and off. And almost always is, it's defaulted to on. 
and they have performance cookies, four or five different kinds of cookies. You have no memory of what happened there. You carry a cookie saying what your preference was, but it's remembered somewhere else where there's no auditing, there's no way to get at it, you know, but they call that compliance. And, yeah. you know, there may be some, you know, um, maybe some data privacy authority, uh, protection authorities in some countries are attacking that as inadequate, but it's happening very, very slowly. And it's made the experience of using the web worse. And of course, all of the perpetrators get to say, hey, look, we're getting lots of compliance. We're getting lots of acceptance. People don't mind being tracked. See, they clicked on all these things. So it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's a giant fail. And, but but I'm, I'm kind of, my own feeling is we need something new that's not the web. It's something else. And we don't have it yet. We have to invent it. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it needs to be something else. But it isn't the ugly truth that nobody actually does care. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the it's no, like, I, no, it's like I think we have four, do we have four people here? That's a start that care. Yeah, um, it's, I think plenty of like actually populism. people do care every single it's, time that people. Okay. So, so Joseph Turo and several other folks back at, at Annenberg at Penn in Philadelphia did a survey a few years back. I think it was in 2015 where they, where they found that people, acquiesce to what they think is unavoidable, that they've lost their privacy. They don't like it. Um, one trust, which is what, as far as I know, is one of these companies that's involved in the compliance business in its current incarnation, but they had annual surveys and they found that 95% of people feel like they have no privacy online, that they've acquiesced to it because we have to use it given that there are privacy compromises that we have to make. Doesn't mean we like it. Doesn't mean we accept it. Doesn't mean nobody cares. I think people do care. It's just that they've acquiesced to it. Oh, yeah, but you see, I, I think what I'm saying is not that that doesn't exist, but more that, uh, you know, I talk to the folk who are here in the office or I talk to people who are in the neighborhood and most of them say, yeah, you know, it's a shame that we we don't have any privacy. But, hey, did you see that quiz on Facebook? And and they, yeah. they for, for them, privacy is is not something they care about. Uh, they 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 would like it if they could have it, but they they don't they've not been made angry about privacy the way that that really probably all four of us have, uh, and I wonder whether the thing that needs to happen is not to come up with a new tech, uh, because tech never solves social problems, but rather to make people angry about the real problem. You know, so I, what I do is I mm -hmm. I find that old story. Do you remember the story that was uh, about Target? knowing that a teenage girl was pregnant before her father did uh, because they detected the change in the patterns of her buying at, at Target. And they started sending her coupons. And her father came to the store and said, why are you sending my daughter coupons? Are you trying to make her want to go and get pregnant? And it turned out she was already pregnant. And Target's um, uh, triangulation on all of the data sources about his daughter had detected that and had started sending out the coupons. And I find people get really angry about that story, that the, that the store has got access to all of those data sources and isn't just using the data that's disclosed, but is interpolating the secrets that aren't disclosed. And that stalking, that violation of private spaces using cleverness gets people angry. And I think we need to talk about that and not about privacy, because honestly, nobody cares about privacy. Everybody cares about being stalked. Yeah, I don't know though. I don't know if I buy that word stalked. That's the thing that that's the thing that comes back to me whenever someone starts talking about like Facebook and all of these things and they go before Congress and they testify. Uh they 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 I think this is a natural outcome of some very smart people developing algorithms to try to sell stuff. Yes, granted, they're trying to sell stuff to people. That's why they do it. But I don't think it's, you know, Target wasn't, nobody at Target was sitting down and saying, let's look at this person and see what they're buying. Oh, let's send them a coupon. It was all an algorithm. And it just so happened to send her those coupons because it picked up on what she was searching for, buying, whatever. Like, it's really not stalking. I, I, I agree that I don't like it, but I'm just saying, I think that people over conflate these things and think there's somebody pulling some string somewhere and they're looking at all of our data when actually nobody's looking at the data in person. It's all going through an algorithm and nobody's really even seeing right. this stuff. And but they can. I mean, I think we, we've shown in a few good examples, especially, you know, things like cell phone tracking, that you can easily de-anonymize data. It's, it's not that difficult. And I think 
I wonder, does the intent matter? I mean, just because they didn't intend to, to uh, you know, target this individual, you know, by design, if the if the outcome is that this individual was targeted in that way, I mean, does it? Why? I'm not sure the intent behind the uh, marketing tracking matters. I, I think it does. The story says they did intend it. The story says they did intend it. The story tells you how Target had done this research and had actively started sending out pregnancy coupons, and they discovered it freaked women out getting a book of of, of coupons right. about a pregnancy they hadn't told anyone about, and so they started hiding the coupons in coupons for things they knew that the customer didn't want, like lawnmowers and and uh, cases of beer, and people began to believe the coupons that they were getting that contained the targeted. Uh, information were actually uh, neighborhood wide rather than targeted at them. But I'll give you another example the stuff that Cambridge Analytica did, where Cambridge mm. Analytica deduced that the people who were going to swing the vote for Trump or the sweet people who were going to swing the vote for Brexit in my country, they identified who those people were and made a data set of them and allowed the campaigns to target them with psychologically crafted advertising to try and swing their vote. That story also makes people angry when you tell it to them, whereas yeah, nobody cares what they do with the data that they released. You know, if I give you if I gave the store my credit card number and my name and my address and my date of birth. Yeah, I'd like them to keep it secret. But, you, you know, I, I have already disclosed that, but I haven't disclosed the affair I'm having. I haven't disclosed my voting intent in the next election. I haven't disclosed that you know, there's a whole load of things I haven't disclosed. And I would be mortified to discover that um, the uh, a political campaign had deduced that and were now going to use it to blackmail or persuade me into voting in the way that they wanted. Uh, I think those are the things that will turn people on to uh, privacy, not the word privacy and not the idea of keeping their, their information secret. Yeah, I like that example a lot better, Simon. So thanks for adding that one. Mm -hmm. um, because I think intent does matter. Obviously, the intent there was to to sway someone, to push someone in a certain direction. It was very intentional what they were doing. Um, and as you say, maybe the target thing was too. But I think all too many times you, you, you see people say, oh, this happened to me or whatever, but it wasn't because somebody was, you know, it was it was an unhappy circumstance, not somebody intentionally doing something. I think you're absolutely right. If there is intent behind there to do harm, then absolutely something should be done about that. And you're right. People will get upset about that when they hear it that way. So I, I think I there are to, always under, yeah, I'm sorry, go I was going to say, no, go I think ahead. there are always go unintended ahead, consequences, yeah. even, even w whether the intent is bad or good, there are unintended consequences. And I think that's, that's the thing to keep in mind always is that, you know, just because yes, they were targeting a group of consumer, but they weren't obviously targeting this one specific girl or this one specific family, but, but um, again, unintended consequences. And, and, and as more of those come to light, I think it's, it's important to figure out, you know, the cause regardless of the intent. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. What's the, what's the solution? Is it, is it, you know, a long time ago we had internet too, that was about the, uh, more about the technology and the speed of the internet. Is there something like you say, Doc, is there something that we need to do to uh, create something completely new that people can use without fear of privacy concerns and other things? Well, we can go into a, a new thing is hot right now that we have on our list called Web3. But first, I have to let people know that about Club Twit. Um, Club Twit's another great way to support our network. Um, as a member, you get access to ad free versions of all the shows on Twit, including this one, uh, as well as other benefits. There's a bonus Twit Plus feed that includes footage and discussions that didn't make the final show edit, as well as bonus shows we've started, such as the Untitled Linux Show, hosted by our very own Jonathan Bennett, uh, the Giz Fizz, and other monthly members only content. Uh, then there's the community aspect of it. We have a really fun Discord server that's available only for Club Twit members. Uh, there you can chat with uh, other members about the shows and many other topics and whether technical or not. There's even a beer and cocktails chat on our Discord. Of course, you have to provide <laughs> your own actual liquids in the physical world. So sign up um, to Club Twit. It's for the cost of one fancy cup of coffee per month. Uh, that's just $7 a month gets you into the club. Head over to Club Twit. Uh, and it's at twit.tv slash club twit and join today. 
Okay, so um, so Aaron was just asking, you know, what's the answer here? And the answer is always like the next page, you know, in the, in the book that we're writing uh, of the history of of life in Flossland. And I'm not sure of Web 3.0. That's the new thing, and it's um, some of it is metaverse, and some of it is. Um, uh, I mean, talking about the verbiage going on about it, you know, so some of the talk about it, um, uh, the, the future of internet. Um, there are a couple of pieces here I'm looking at, you know, what is web three and why is it called the internet of the future? There was a Twitter thread by Chris Dixon, Dixon of Andreessen Horowitz, um, which had a title as it were with the first tweet, how to open, how open, and this is important, how open lost to closed in web two and how web three can bring open back. Um, and open losing to close that that's close to my heart and mind because, um, you know, I was one of the early bloggers and I had up to 50,000 readers a day on, on my blog and the bottom fell out of that when all the other bloggers and all of the readers went to Facebook and Twitter, Facebook and Twitter just ate it up and that, and, you know, because I was on WordPress, actually it was on something else before that, but it was all open and. And it was, you know, free and mine and not, you know, it wasn't a suburb of some corporate entity. I didn't have them at the mercy of some, some evil big corporation, but they were, they were mine and that's gone. Uh, I mean, the blogs, I still have a blog. It's, I went at, at, a, at a university, I have a couple of them there, but, but it's not the same. I mean, I, dozens of readers there, many more people here, right? So, um, but Web3, anybody here want to take a stab at what they think Web3 is? It's been around long enough that we can make fun of it, don't you think? Does it include blockchain? That's what I want to know. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. It may, oh, okay. it may, it may include it, it, blockchain or distributed ledgers or, you know, yeah. It's but it, blockchain is an operating system, Aaron. <laughs> well, that's perfect, actually, because I was, I was, of course, I was joking because we love to talk about blockchain. But actually, as as Doc was explaining and talking about it, I thought, oh, blockchain would actually be perfect for this, a uh, great use for for this type of thing. But I don't, I don't know much about Web three really, uh, except what what I'm reading currently in the article. So, well, I think decentralization is is the thing. I think, I think. <laughs> As a potential answer to the question earlier is that, you know, perhaps decentralization implies uh, decentralized control, right? And if people can control what they share and don't, then maybe that is a con contributor to uh, solving this privacy conversation. But that seems like a long way off. Um, so, so let's have a go at talking about what Web3 is. Web3 is the the web where instead of like on Web2, where it's centralized processing for what everybody mistakenly believes is decentralized. This is decentralized processing for what everybody mistakenly believes is under nobody's control. And uh, it involves using blockchains to permanently record immutable information and to allow the uh, the creation of binding relationships immutably without the need for the creation of an authority. Uh, it also has got uh, a lot of embrace of distributed auto autonomous organizations, uh, uh, um, ironically forgetting that the original DAO, Digital uh, Autonomous Organization, was uh, spectacularly hacked and with the loss of everybody's money. Um, so. Web3, to me, has got a good deal of idealism behind it and uh, possibly lacks a firm grasp of uh, human nature and the solutions to its defects. Uh, but how do, you, how do you see it, Doc? Well, I, I, I see it as a bunch of claims at this point, which are always good. I mean, I think we need we need people pointing toward where something goes. Um I'm looking at one right now, you know, where it's, you know, again, like as Catherine says, it's decentralized, open. Um, so this guy's writing here, we finally have private property on the internet. I'm not sure. I, I guess if you have NFTs there or something like that, I mean, that's sort of the dream of NFTs. Um, but it says here in Web3, you own your own data. I'm not sure owning data is a possibility. Data is inherently a public good, uh, economically speaking. As Kevin Kelly puts it, the internet is a copy machine. Um, but you can have some control with uh, digital private keys. Your data are the equivalent of a safe, de 
digital safe deposit, only you have the keys to open the safe. That's what it says on this one. I, I, I think these are, at, you know, it, it's all aspirational, but, you know, it's out of aspirations that cool things get made, right? So so maybe it'll maybe it'll happen. Um, you know, I, I don't see any of the giants jumping in on it, but maybe that's, um, or maybe they are, I mean, in, 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 to the degree that Facebook. Facebook with the metaverse and all of that is, is part of it. But, um, uh, but, you know, but, but DAOs are, you know, it is, this guy's calling it a government built on top of web three protocols. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think we're probably, we've probably got the name for it now, but I'm not sure it's going to be exactly what they're talking about here. And I like to think about, okay, let's say we're at web four. What are we making fun of at web three? I mean, what are we saying didn't work in web three? Right. Because right now we're saying, oh, geez, in web two, we gave up our freedom and open went to hell and you know, we got stuck inside giant feudal systems where we're vassals to multiple companies at once. Well, what, what's going to happen in Web3? It's like, well, remember that entire DAO went down or all the DAOs went down, you know, and everybody's stuff got spilled on the streets. I don't know. I mean, but it may help to think ahead of that, you know, toward that future. Yeah. yeah I, I think, mean, I, I think something. I, go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that. The, <laughs> Something that Doc always says about w wizards and muggles is relevant here. I think there are two worlds, yeah. right, interacting with the internet. I think there are people, people like me, who interact with the internet in lots of ways. I interact as a consumer. I interact as, as a you know, a software engineer. I, er I interact as you know, a person watching Netflix or whatever. But um, I, I think that the when, when you talk about the big, the big players in tech, the the Facebooks and the Apples and those people. I think that those are the conduits through which most of the world interacts with the internet. So, you know, regardless of, of the de decentralization that Web3 brings or the potential decentralization, I think that those large entities will still at least try to take, you know, impose some sort of ownership over, over that arena regardless. Because again, that, I mean, most people do not have you know, let's say the tech skills to in, to decide how they get to interact with with the web, whatever the web is, and so you go go through something like Facebook, and, the, and Facebook then you know owns your experience. Yeah, and the thing that got me excited about this was kind of the decentralized part of it in terms of government uh, also having influence over what happens on the internet, but. Ultimately, governments still control access to the wires, right? Um, and so I guess my balloon was deflated a little bit when I started to think about this because um, although it would take their, um, it may take governments say so and how the uh, system is run out of the picture, they can still ultimately just say like, like lots of uh, governments do, um, they just shut off the the bits and you know you just don't get access to it at all um so it solves it seems, it seems like the in theory it solves some problems with privacy and control but there's still unfortunately a, a reality that the government you know oh you don't like this app fine we're just going to turn off access to it yeah. so the the challenge that i find in looking at the the web3 talk is the the uh complete confidence in the power of uh, the individual having uh, autonomy. Mm. My experience has been that um, that is often a good thing for the individual to have autonomy and for the uh, wishes of many individuals to be collectively balanced to produce a compromise which is marginally acceptable to the most people, um, mm -hmm. which I think is, is what people sometimes call democracy, but I'm not sure that's really what democracy is. Uh, uh, and I, I think the challenge with the Web3 is that it swings the pendulum so far in the direction of autonomy, and in particular, uh, the idea of the, the uh, infallibility of software when embodied in uh, a digital, a distributed organization, that it becomes impossible to intervene when we discover it's all been gamed. Um, and one of the rules that I, I I tried to make up a number of years ago is the one that says that the more rules there are, the more ways there are to game them. And having a a, a Web3, which is based on um, 
tightly written rules that are then implemented in software in a distributed way with nobody having the authority to intervene and overrule when we discover it's wrong. That was exactly what went wrong with the original DAO. And Web 3.0 seems to uh, uh, not learn that lesson. It seems to believe that having an autonomous, a set of uh, robots running the web is going to be better than having a set of uh, competing regulatory environments uh, trying to run the web. And so I, I think, Doc, when I say, you know, what are we going to be ridiculing in Web3, it's going to be the overwhelming arrogance of believing that programmers can infallibly create a distributed autonomous organization that will safely run Web3. I think that's what we'll be looking on and, and, and ridiculing. I, I am in great admiration of Simon's ability to speak in final draft. <laughs> I, hope, yes. I hope somebody comes along <laughs> to, to edit that, <laughs> just take whole hunks of it. <laughs> that was terribly well put. It really was. Um, and I think that's, I think that's right. I think that the point that, that Catherine is making as well, that, you know, but I think we're mostly wizards here. I'm the least wizardly of, of, of all of us, I think, but, because I'm not a programmer, uh, but um, but I can operate machines <laughs> with some expertise, <laughs> and and uh, and I, at least I know I can make a protocol link at the jargon layer, you know. So I I'm, I'm fluent at, at that stuff, and and I'm busy caring about a lot of stuff that I think you know the rest of the world ought to care about. But as Simon pointed out earlier, a lot of people just don't care about things like like privacy, as he, as he puts it, but they do care about being stalked, which I think is a distinction without a whole lot of difference, but it's a distinction that he's, it, it, you know, talking about stalking and getting actual harms there is important. And I think we should look forward to, you know, what the harms are with Web3. I'm actually remembering what it was like, I could call it Web 0. Point something because there was this period between around 1990 when I first heard about the web, you know, when the word got out of what Tim Berners-Lee and scientists were doing and, um, and trying to get on the internet and failing to get on the internet. It really was um, so envious of anybody who could connect to the internet, but I knew the, I knew the web was there. He get on with links, which is text only. And that was a browser, but it wasn't until 94 when Mosaic came along and, some wizards took a look at Mosaic and said, oh, my God, what can we do? And we can do all kinds of stuff here. And then Netscape happened and Microsoft knocked off Netscape and all in 95. And and after, you know, it, but it also it took not only those, but it took, you know, the um, uh, NSF net standing down and, you know, no longer exercising mm -hmm. its acceptable use policy on, on its one part of the overall Internet backbone. That, that confluence of just circumstances. Um, and one that nobody talks about, which is that all of the big carriers of, of data said, we can't figure out how to build this thing. We're just going to peer, you know, not charge each other anything. And that was just a monstrously useful thing that never would have happened in the ordinary business world, but it did happen in the technical world. And that was not something that some pro programmers got together and said, we're going to do it this way. There was no position paper written. It just you know, a whole lot of geekery and and circumstance and and something emerged that changed everything. And that was in 95. But, you know, but I think it's actually too simplistic to say what was Web 1.0, what was Web 2.0. I mean, Web 2.0 originally was something that that um, Tim O'Reilly had some conferences on and, and John Battelle joined up with Tim O'Reilly to kind of push that kind of like that uh, some publishers, IDG, decided that the term IT was going to be used. That was in like the late 80s. And all of a sudden, everybody's talking about IT, which I remember th thinking was a horrible idea because, wait, wait a minute, that's a pronoun. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, people started using IT and ICT in, in Europe. Um, it's hard, you know, it, 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 it's hard to predict stuff. It, you know, the, um, Alan Kay said the best way to predict the future is to make it, right? So, Who's making this stuff and how is it going to get made? Are we all going to use it? You know, we need all, we, you know, the, everybody uses the web. Everybody uses apps on phones. Who's going to make this that we're all going to use it? And how is that going to get made? It's going to be interesting to see. And who's going to make it in a way that actually does empower the user because there's not a lot of incentive yeah. to do that, unfortunately. You know, there, in, um, 
actually have first heard this about the Catholic Church, and it's probably not exactly true, but there's this principle called subsidiarity. And subsidiarity says that the best decisions are the ones that are made most locally, you know, where people know what's going on. And and I think a lot of what we're calling decentralization is actually about that. It's like, how do we make, how do we make, it's not so much a big system that does, that has, that's inherently decentralized, but how do we get emergent properties out of people locally solving problems in ways that could be generalized, you know, across the world once they become useful? That's kind of what I'm working on here in Bloomington, Indiana. That's why I'm here rather than in California or New York. Um, and some programmers are coming together on that. It's like just in the just today, you know, um, some stuff has come up that I'm dealing with, and it's like, whoa, stuff's happening. I got to like look at this and see what what it's going to be. Um, and but I don't know whether it's not it's going to be generalizable or not. Is it going to? But it's going to happen here. It's going to happen in the physical world. Um, and maybe if it works, it'll, it can be generalized, but maybe not generally not is the way to bet. Right. I mean, most things fail at first. Simon's not at first. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, any great idea has to fail twice before it can succeed. Sure. Someone said that. <laughs> if not, they just did. <laughs> they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, 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 I mean, we always used to observe that again at, at Sun was uh, we, we had this thing called Grid Engine that uh, we implemented that was a, a, basically the forerunner of cloud computing. And uh, it itself was the re-implementation of an earlier idea. And both of those failed for us. And what when cloud computing did, did succeed, it wasn't Sun doing it, but it was all the ideas that we had proven in our work and in other uh, large scale computing activities that made cloud computing succeed. And generally speaking, anything, anything that's spectacularly uh, capable is going to take a couple of attempts before you get it right. And so I would say any, any great advance has to fail before it, at least twice before it can succeed. But as I say, I'm sure someone said that. I can hear rapid Googling. Like I'm in the background. Yeah, well, you know, actually, I'm, not Googling. That's me. I was writing, looking for it, but I can't find it. I, I'm writing down something in our back chat here, and that every time I finish and hit return, it makes it disappear. This is IRC for you. <laughs> Sorry. But there's a quote from yesterday. Is Somebody said, you can only be right for so long before somebody pays you for it. Which is actually false. I think you can be right forever and never get paid for it. That <laughs> That's possible. That's but true. I think it... But, but I but I was thinking, you know, how long was the internet around before it really took off? How long was how long was the web? The web was around for five years at least before it did. Linux was around for a bit, you know. Uh, we talked about PHP earlier. Um, I think, you know, the degree it worked with blogs, you know, and um, WordPress and all that. WordPress came along in the in the aughts. It was after the new millennium. Yeah. Um, the, Free software you know, these, was these, around 15 years before open source made it. Yes, easy. exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and 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 even there, you know, the the best intent. I mean, a bunch of geeks got together in early two, in 1998 and decided we're going to talk about open source instead of free software. Um, but that. You know, and you were terribly involved. Terribly is a terrible uh, adverb, but you, you were fully involved in a very productive way with OSI, Simon. And um, and I think for all the good efforts of OSI, there's no real agreement in the general population, even though everybody can talk about open source. And most people don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> Still don't know what the hell it is. You know, I, Am I wrong? You know, I don't think it, I don't think it was actually open source that that made open source succeed. It was, you know, it wasn't the phrase. <laughs> what, 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 what made open source succeed was um, having just sufficient uh, confidence that a piece of software was okay for you to use in your um, in your 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 side gig or in your small business that people actually built businesses on it. And gaining that confidence came from, I think, the agreement that there would be approved licenses that we'd call open source. And I think that was the that was the magic source that turned free software into a a, a generation changing endeavor. Uh, and in turn, open source could only happen when the internet was something that ordinary people rather than only researchers could have. And in turn, that only that was only catalyzed when 
uh, the software for running it got out of the labs and and into businesses. Uh, and so each of these developments, as they've happened, has been about the, the catalyzation of uh, earlier advances that hadn't learned how to succeed yet. And uh, maybe that's what we're looking for here in the privacy debate as well. Maybe we've we've worked out that we need our privacy back, that we need people to stop stalking us and stop targeting us on deduced data. But we've got to catalyze it with some next advance. And um, maybe that is Web3. Maybe it will be the imperfection of a blockchain-based operating system that will get us there. Maybe the four of us could start the Web3 Foundation and, uh, <laughs> and make it do what we want it so to we do. So we can fund its development. Yeah. <laughs> so we can fund it so that we can go out for funding and, and all of that. Um, there's a, a friend of mine said that for every new consortium, there should be, there's always an equal and opposite consortium. Um, <laughs> I remember when, <laughs> when the Liberty Alliance came along, there was a WS Star Foundation and or thing, and they fought each other. And, um, and another friend said, um, Every new nonprofit should require another nonprofit to go away. And so I think there's a similar, a similar principle, similar principle there. Um, it's it's not a ship and you can't steer it, you know, but you build it anyway. Um, I think we're kind of getting toward the end of the show here. So is there any way to summarize that we were just that draw a thread through all this stuff so I can write the summary because <laughs> I always have to write the summary at the end of the show. Well, I think Simon could just write it for you real quickly. Yeah, and, Simon and could just dictate it. Final draft. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is interesting because we started talking about the past, right? About SCO and, and Linux and all that. And yeah. then we kind of ended up talking about the future possibility um, I don't know. We could make we could make the uh, the draft a little bit more optimistic, but you know we really co we really covered the gamut here. Funding. Open well, we source. can't be stopped. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Web one? three is what we will make of it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good one. That's actually good. It's what what we make of it. Everything's what we make of it. I mean, basically, what floss is about is making stuff, right? I mean, it's all it'll be what we make of it. It's not about talking about stuff. It's actually about making stuff. You know, yeah. what are we going to make? You know, and then yeah. and then 20 years from now, Aaron's going to have a collection of it in, in, in the back of his office. <laughs> That's right. So we might, go into, we might go into the plugs at this point because we've, we've covered blockchain and, and the other things we usually have a check mark next to. So Aaron, why don't, why don't you start with whatever you got to plug? Uh, yeah, as always, uh, sorry, I didn't prep uh, for this one a little bit, but, you know, uh, my YouTube channel talking about uh, restoring old computers is always available for anyone. I'm always looking for more viewers. If you like old, uh, you know, Atari and Commodore 64 and uh, IBM stuff, you can go over to my channel and see what I'm working on. Uh, that's Retro Hack Shack on YouTube. So that, that would be my plug for today. That's very cool. So, so Catherine. <laughs> oh, do I have something to plug? Sure, yeah. If you if you enjoy hearing hearing uh, the sound of my voice and Docs at the same time and in the, in the same uh, episodes, uh, we we do a thing called Reality Two Cast. Uh, you can find it at realitytocast.com and on Twitter and and elsewhere. And um, I don't know. I should probably plug my employer. They're generous enough to not only employ me but contribute to the PHP Foundation and Drupal Project, and I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and I think that's about all I've got. And who is your employer? <laughs> oh, I didn't. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I did a really great job of plugging them without mentioning their name, which is Aquia. <laughs> You'll see them on that list Excellent. of uh, companies funding the PHP Project. And and how that's about the you, Drupal Company? It's it's the yeah. Drupal oh, yeah. company. The Drupal company. It's the Drupal company. Let's be clear. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 we were talking about and, the WordPress uh, company and Matt Bolenbeck. Well, this is the Drupal company. Now you see that behind um, my, uh, where is it? Oh, it's that sign. Nope. Nope. It's right there. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I see that. I see it there. And I, you know, I have a lot of respect for the uh, for the, the the Drupal organization and the, the foundation behind it. So I, I usually don't have anything to plug. Uh, however, um, I, Doc mentioned uh, the OSI, and OSI just got a new uh, executive director, Stefano Mafuli, who I hope, Doc, we're going to invite on to. Yes, we should. As well. It's a great idea. everybody. And um, uh, OSI has got a membership drive that has just started. 
it is at join.opensource.org. That's join.opensource.org. And the great novelty there is we've introduced a free membership tier. So uh, everybody who is listening or watching can become an OSI member completely for free. Uh, if you would like to also pay to be a member and to help us run the organization, help us defend open source around the world, uh, then that would be welcome as well. But we'd really like to get everybody who uh, is keen to see open source uh, adopted uh, in more places to go to join.opensource.org and uh, and join now. And I've put the the link is going to be in the show notes. And I know that John will paste in a screenshot of it into this point in the show before it gets put out on the web. And this is the point in the show where I um, uh, where <laughs> I, I forecast the next guest. And uh, we actually don't have something concrete scheduled yet. We have a whole bunch in the queue. We don't have a particular one, but I guarantee it's going to be a good show. And that's coming up next week. Thanks for being with us and we'll see you then. So you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason, you're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography, but eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show hands on photography here on twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post processor. And quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera. That's that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your, your birthday or gifts or what have you. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So head on over to twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash H O P and subscribe today. <laughs>